Welcome to another episode of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Today we're going to talk about tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, just a reminder, these slides and this video are available under the Creative Commons license. I'd like to thank Andreas Antonopoulos and Gavin Wood for uh, putting their content on the Mastering Ethereum GitHub site, also under this license. So today we're going to take a look at tokens. Um, so the word token derives from the Old English. Uh, it means a sign or a symbol. It's commonly used to refer to privately issued special purpose coin-like items of insignificant intrinsic value, such as uh, tokens you might use on a bus, tokens you might use at an arcade, an arcade playing video games or, or, or using for you know, pinball machines or tokens you might use in a laundry machine. Nowadays, tokens administered on the blockchain are redefining the token word to mean blockchain-based abstractions that can be owned and that represent assets, currency, or access rights. The association between the word token and insignificant value has a lot to do with the limited use of the physical tokens. Often, these physical tokens are restricted to specific businesses, organizations, or locations. The physical tokens you might use in your laundry machine are not easily exchangeable and typically have only one function for that laundry mat or for that arcade. Uh, with blockchain tokens, however, these restrictions are lifted or more accurately, we could say they're, they've been completely redefined. Many blockchain tokens serve multiple purposes globally and can be traded for each other or for other, other currencies on global liquid markets. With the restrictions on use and ownership gone, the insignificant value expectation for the tokens is also a thing of the past. You know, these tokens that we create with the blockchain are not limited to a price of around 25 cents. So in this lecture, I'm going to take a look at various uses for tokens and how they're created. Uh, we'll also talk about attributes of tokens, such as fungibility and intrinsically. Uh, we'll also examine the standards and technologies that they're based on in subsequent lectures and show how to build your own tokens using Ethereum. So how are tokens used? So the most obvious use of tokens is as digital private currencies. However, this is only one possible use. Tokens can be programmed to serve many different functions. Uh, for example, and, and in many cases, these functions will overlap. A, a token could simultaneously carry a voting right, an access right, as well as being an ownership of a resource. Uh, as the following list shows on this slide, uh, currency is just the first application of a token. So our first uh, application that obviously is currency, a token can serve as a form as a currency with a value determined through trade between different parties. A uh, token can also be a resource. A uh, token can represent a resource earned or produced in a sharing economy or a resource sharing environment. For example, a storage or CPU token representing resources that can be shared over a network. Uh, tokens as an asset. A token can represent ownership of an intrinsic or extrinsic, tangible or intangible asset. For example, people are talking about using tokens to represent gold, real estate, cars, oil, energy, um, you know, gaming items, uh, in video games, intellectual property rights, and many other possibilities. Uh, tokens can represent access rights granting access to physical or digital properties, uh, access to discussion forums, hotel rooms, rental cars, uh, exclusive websites, and so on. Equity, tokens can represent shareholder equity in a digital organization, for example, a decentralized autonomous organization, a DAO, or a legal entity like a corporation. Voting, tokens can represent voting rights in a digital or legal system. Collectibles. Tokens can represent a digital collectible, like uh, a non-fungible token in the CryptoPunks collection, or a physical collectible, like a painting. Uh, identity. A token can represent a digital identity, uh, like an avatar, or a legal identity, like your driver's license. Um, attestation. A token can represent a certificate or an attestation of fact by some authority or by a decentralized reputation system, perhaps a marriage record, a business birth certificate, college degree, and so on. Uh, utility. Tokens can be used to access or pay for services. 
So, you know, as I mentioned, often a single token may provide multiple uh, or several of these functions. And sometimes it's hard to discern between the functions as the physical equivalents have always been inextricably linked. For example, in the physical world, a driver's license is an attestation, but it's also an identity document and it's hard to separate those two functions. In the digital realm, some of these commingle functions can be separated and developed independently. For example, you can have an anonymous attestation, which is not provided by an authority, unlike your driver's license, which is provided by a specific governmental authority. So let's talk about tokens and fungibility. So in economics, fungibility is a property of a good or a commodity whose individual units are essentially interchangeable. Tokens are fungible when we can substitute any single unit of the token for another without any difference in its value or function. So this unit of this particular uh, fungible token is has the same capabilities as this other unit of this particular fungible token. So strictly sinking, speaking, if a token's historical provenance can be tracked, then it's not entirely fungible because you can tell a difference between the two. So the ability to track provenance can lead to blacklisting and whitelisting, which can reduce or limit fungibility. For example, if you could track the, uh, the historical province, you can see that, for example, one particular token was used in the black market or another token was not used in the black market. And that might lead to blacklisting or whitelisting. Non-fungible tokens are tokens that each represent a unique tangible or intangible item and therefore not interchangeable. Uh, for example, a token that represents ownership of a specific Van Gogh paint painting is not equivalent to another token that represents a Picasso painting, even though they both might be part of the same art ownership token system. Similarly, a token representing a specific digital collectible, such as a specific crypto kitty like Nana Mean Butt, is not interchangeable with any other crypto kitty. Uh, just like, you know, two cats are not interchangeable, they are two distinct cats. So each non fungible token is associated with a unique identifier similar to a serial number or a social security number. We're going to see examples of both fungible and non fungible tokens later in this lecture. Note that fungible is often used to mean directly exchangeable for money. For example, a casino token can be cashed in, while laundry tokens typically cannot. This is not the sense in which we're using fungible in this lecture. So let's talk about counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is the risk that the other party in a transaction is going to fail to meet their obligations. Some types of transactions will suffer additional counterparty risk because there are more than two parties involved in the transaction. For example, if you hold a certificate of deposit for precious metal and you sell that certificate of deposit to someone, there are going to be at least three parties in that transaction. There's the seller of the certificate, there's a buyer of the certificate, and there's a custodian of the precious metal that the certificate is uh, claiming to convey. Someone holds the physical asset. By necessity, they become party to the fulfillment of the transaction, and they add counterparty risk to any transaction involving that risk because there's a risk that that person actually isn't going to deliver the precious asset. So that's the counterparty risk. So in general, when an asset is traded indirectly, through the exchange of a token of ownership, uh, there is an additional counterparty risk from the custodian of the asset. Does that custodian actually still have the asset? Will they recognize or allow the transfer of ownership based on the transfer of a token, such as a certificate, deed, title, or digital token? In the world of digital tokens representing assets, as in the non-digital physical world, it's important to understand who holds the asset that is represented by the token and what rules apply to that underlying asset. So let's talk about tokens and intrinsicality. The word intrinsic derives from the Latin intra, meaning from within. Some tokens represent digital items that are intrinsic to the blockchain. So for those digital assets, they're governed by the blockchain consensus rules, just like the tokens themselves. This has an important implication 
Tokens that represent intrinsic assets do not carry additional counterparty risk. If you hold the keys to a crypto kitty, there is no other party holding that crypto kitty for you as far as the non-fungible token is concerned, but uh, you own that non-fungible token directly. However, there's still a counterparty risk in that uh, the app, the CryptoKitty app is not actually owned by you. It's actually owned by the provider of the CryptoKitty app. So there is some counterparty risk there. Uh, the blockchain consensus rules apply to the non-fungible token and your ownership or control of the private keys is equivalent to ownership of the asset without an intermediary. Conversely, many tokens are used to represent extrinsic things, such as real estate, corporate voting shares, trademarks, and gold bars. The ownership of those items, which is not within the blockchain, is governed by law, custom, and policy, separate from the consensus rules that govern the token. In other words, token issuers and owners may still depend on real-world non-smart con non -smart contracts. Uh, as a result, these intrinsic assets carry additional counterparty risk because they're held by custodians, recorded in external registries, or controlled by laws and policies outside the blockchain environment. So let's say, for example, you were trying to transfer real estate uh, using the blockchain. So the amount of non counterparty risk would be significantly greater than the counterparty risk for that crypto kitty that we just mentioned. Uh, one of the most important ramifications of blockchain-based tokens is the ability to convert extrinsic assets into intrinsic assets and thereby uh, minimize the counterparty risk. A good example is moving from equity in a corporation, which is, which is extrinsic to an equity or voting token in a DAO or similar intrinsic organization, again, minimizing the counterparty risk. Uh, we'll never completely remove it, but we can minimize it. So let's talk about using tokens, utility or equity. Almost all projects in Ethereum today launch with some kind of token. But do all these projects really need tokens? Are there any disadvantage to using a token? Or will we see the slogan, tokenize all the things, come to fruition? In principle, the use of tokens can be seen as a management or organization tool. In practice, the integration of blockchain platforms, including Ethereum, into the existing of structures of society means that so far, there are many limitations to the applicability of tokens. So let's start by clarifying the role of token in a new project. Um, the majority of projects are using tokens in one of two ways, either as a utility token or as an equity token. But very often, those two to roles are going to overlap. So utility tokens are those tokens where the use of the token is required to gain access to a service, application, or a resource. Examples of utility tokens include tokens that represent resources, such as shared storage, or access to services such as social media networks. Equity tokens are those tokens that represent shares in the control or ownership of something, such as a startup. Equity tokens can be limited as non-voting shares for distribution of dividends and profits, or as expansive as voting shares in a decentralized autonomous organization, where management of the platform is through some complex governance system based on votes by the token holders. Uh, many startups face a difficult question. Tokens are a great uh, fundraising mechanism. But offering securities or equity to the public is a regulated activity in most jurisdictions. Uh, by claiming that equity tokens are utility tokens, many startups hope to get around these regulatory restrictions and raise money from a public offering while preventing it, while describing it as a pre-sale of service access vouchers or calling it a utility token. Whether a thinly disguised equity offering will be able to skirt the regulators is highly doubtful, however. As the popular saying goes, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. Regulators are not likely to be distracted by uh, semantic contortions. Instead, they're likely to see uh, claims, these sorts of legal claims, as an attempt to deceive the public. So who really needs utility tokens? The real problem is that utility tokens introduce significant risks and adoption barriers for startups. Perhaps in a distant future, tokenize all the things will become reality, but at present, the set of people who have an understanding of and desire to use a token is a subset of the already small cryptocurrency market.
For a startup, each innovation represents a risk and a market filter. Innovation is taking the road least traveled, walked away, walking away from the path of tradition. Uh, the innovation is already, you know, is already a lonely walk. If a startup is trying to innovate in a new area of technology, such as storage sharing over peer-to-peer -peer networks, that's already a lonely enough path. Adding a utility token to that innovation and requiring users to adopt tokens in order to use the service compounds the risk for the startup and increases the barriers to adopting that startup's new technology. You know, it's walking off the already lonely trail of peer-to-peer -peer storage innovation and into the wilderness. Think of each innovation as a filter. Each additional innovation you put into your startup will limit adoption of the subset of the market that can become early adopters of this innovation. Adding a second innovation filter will compound that effect, further limiting the addressable market for that startup. You're asking your early adopters to not, to adopt not one, but two completely new technologies. Uh, the novel application platform you service you built and the token economy. For a startup, each innovation introduces risk that increases the chance of failure of the startup. If you take your already risky startup idea and add a utility token, you're adding all the risks to the underlying platform, like Ethereum, the broader economy, like uh, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges and liquidity, the regulatory environment, uh, dealing with equity and commodity regulations, and the new technology standards, like smart contracts and token standards. That's a lot of risk for a startup. So advocates tokenize all the themes will likely counter that by adopting tokens, the startups are also inheriting the marketing enthusiasm, early adopters, technology, innovation, and liquidity of the entire token economy. That's true, but the question is whether the benefits and enthusiasm for tokens outweighs the additional risks and uncertainties. Nevertheless, some of the most innovative business ideas are indeed taking place in the crypto realm. Uh, if regulators are not quick enough to uh, adopt laws and support new business models, entrepreneurs and associated talent will seek to operate in other jurisdictions that are more crypto friendly. This is already happening. Um, finally, at the beginning of this lecture, when introducing tokens, uh, we discussed the meaning of token as something of insignificant value. The underlying reason for the insignificant value of most tokens is because they can only be used in a very narrow context, like a particular bus company, a particular laundromat, an arcade, a hotel, or a company store. Limited liquidity, limited applicability, and high conversion costs reduce the value of tokens until they're only of token value, like a 25 cents or nominal amount. So when you add a utility token to your platform, but the token can only be used in your single platform through a small market, you're recreating the conditions that made physical tokens of minimal value. This may indeed be the correct way to incorporate tokenization in your project. However, in order to use your platform, a user has to convert something into your utility platform token, use it, and then convert the remainder back into something more generally useful. Um, so the switching costs of a digital token are orders of magnitude lower than for a physical token without a market, but they're not zero. Utility tokens that work across an entire industry sector will be very interesting and probably quite valuable. But if you set up your startup to have to bootstrap an entire industry standard in order to succeed, you may have entered, put too much risk into your startup. One of the benefits of deploying services on a general purpose blockchain platform like Ethereum is being able to connect smart contracts and therefore the utility of tokens uh, across different projects, increasing the potential for liquidity and utility of tokens. So to summarize, you wanna make the decision to include tokens in your project for the right reasons. Adopt a token because your application needs a token in order to function. Adopting the token because a token lifts a, a market barrier or solves an access problem. Don't introduce a token because it's the only way you can raise money fast and you're trying to pretend that that token is not a public securities offering. So I'd like to uh, thank everyone for watching this introductory uh, lecture on tokens in Ethereum. And tune in next time, we're gonna dive in deeper into the Ethereum ERC-20 standard.